notes, just some quick caveats before we begin. So there's going to be a session on single cell RNA-seq in a couple of weeks. Um, this all involves bulk RNA sequencing data. Uh, single cell is a little bit different because the data is much more sparse, um, which, is, which is due to how single cell, you know, basically works. Um, and then, you know, this is all, so where I'm going to take you is mainly from, you know, you've gotten your data back from, you know, wherever you're getting your RNA-seq data, you know, walk-up sequencing or GP, or maybe you, you know, contract with, uh, I've worked with some people who do their sequencing at like the Dana-Farber core um, or wherever, but you're getting your sequencing back. And this basically takes you from, okay, I have some FASTQ files, what do I do with them um, through, to, through alignment? and then through differential gene expression analysis. And actually the biggest focus on this is alignment because understanding how alignment works um, is I think, in my opinion, a really big part of understanding how to implement a lot of the tools that will help you do differential gene expression analysis. So this, so another caveat is, you know, this basically, I'm assuming that, you know, at this point, once you have your fast cues, you have, adequate depth of sequencing, which was talked about a little bit last week by Caroline, um, and uh, good, experiment, good, good experimental design. So, you know, your knockouts and, you know, your, your knockout and your non-knockout, your wild type are, you know, in the same genetic background, good quality sequencing data. So the RNA that you submitted to GP or the libraries that you submitted to GP or wherever you submitted are um, of good quality, you have good RIN values, and then stringent selection of differential gene expression, differentially expressed genes. These are all essential to a robust analysis. And what I mean when I say robust is that um, when I personally have done comparisons between, let's say, DEC2 and EDGE R, which are two R packages which um, handle differential gene expression identification, you should see 70 to 80 percent concordance. They, they, they use different methods. But if you are talking about a robustly differentially expressed gene, you will, you will be able to see the vast majority of those genes identified as differentially expressed with, you know, different p-values and things like that, because the methods aren't the same. But across methods, you should see quite a, quite a good amount of concordance. And if you don't, that's a sign that, you know, maybe we need to step back and start looking at, um, you know, your PCA plot and see, you know, hey, are there... Um, uh, you know, are, are there other issues in terms of the quality of the sequencing data that are throwing off this differential gene expression analysis? So I'm sort of assuming that you've done that QC, um, but you're more than welcome to, you know, to send me an email uh, or we can talk about it uh, next week or you can ask me during this primer, you know, about how you fix those issues. But I'm sort of assuming that those are not present. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I've worked with human and mouse, and I've also worked with rat and pig and grizzly bear and a decent number of um, non-model organisms. And if you're working with human and mouse, you're pretty much set. You've got a great transcriptome. Gen code has really got you covered. Um, and if you're working with a non-model organism, especially if the transcriptome is only computationally defined or incomplete, this process can get a bit harder, especially if you don't have fully assembled chromosomes and you're working from contigs. That's not to say that's not possible. It's just to say that the amount of evidence that you would want to show to show that, you know, a given transcript is differentially expressed, the burden of proof may be a little bit higher. Um, so I just wanted to set, out, set aside those caveats. Um, so I'm assuming that, you know, you're working in, uh, you know, you have good sequencing data and you have good experimental design. I'm assuming all of that before we start this. Okay, so jumping into the overview, I'm going to really briefly run through basic sequencing data, QC. This is sort of before you align. And then the vast majority of this talk focuses on alignment of sequencing data. And I'll walk you through aligners and pseudo aligners. Um, and I'll, and if, you're, if you use the Broad service, if you use the Broad server prem, I'll show you how to load those as dot kits, or I'll show you how they're referred to as dot kits. We'll talk a little bit about quantification of aligned transcriptome data. Um, and then we'll talk about processing and normalizing data, identifying differentially expressed genes. And then I have not that many slides, but a few slides at the end on pathway analysis of differentially expressed genes. Okay, so basic QC. Before you align, as Caroline covered last week, you always want to QC your data before you alignment. The sequencing platform does some for you. So that's one of the nice advantages of doing your sequencing internally on the road. We, we have a lot of pipelines that we can access through GATK and through, you know, um, and other pipelines that basically get you, like, you get a sense of, hey, is the actual data I'm getting, you know, raw data from the fast queues, is that in good shape? Um, but if you want to run this yourself, and this is a great piece of software, I highly recommend doing it, 
we have this piece of software, FastQC, which is developed by Baberham Bioinformatics. Their website is fantastic. Um, so if you do a search for FastQC, they have a ton of examples, but you can load that dot kit um, by loading dot FastQC dash zero dot one one dot nine um, on prem. And there's also programs that allow for read trimming. Um, we won't get into this in too much detail, but if you have like, uh, if your reads are kind of short or if you have adapter contamination or the RNA molecules that you put into your initial library preparation are short, you may want to look into these tools such as CutAdapt or FastX Toolkit. And there are others too. I just picked these because these are the ones I have some experience with and I think they're pretty robustly supported. So, you know, basic sequencing data QC, um, all before you align. So moving into alignment, um, okay. So this is, I'm gonna take a second to walk through this slide. Um, so there's these upstream processes in gray, experimental design, isolation, library prep, and this has all pretty much happened. So what we're gonna focus on is in this section is this area in red. So these are core processes of, you know, this is next generation sequencing workflow. It's not even necessarily specific to RNA sequencing. You'd be doing this with ChIP-seq or whole genome sequencing, all of it. Um, but, you know, at this point, we're basically saying, okay, let's map the reads to a reference um, and make sure that we have everything that we need to map the reads to a, to a reference, including alignment metrics and QC. So that's going to be a lot of this talk, and I'm going to walk you guys through that. And then I'll get into some sections that are on downstream analysis and significance determination. So alignment wise, there's a couple of different, this is a little bit of a deprecated slide, but I wanted to go over it because I think it's an important um, point to make. So for alignment, you can do local or global alignments. And with global alignments, your query sequence, which is your FASTQ, you know, which is your, the, the fourth line of your FASTQ that actually consists of, or that's the second line of your FASTQ that actually consists of the base pairs. It requires a query sequence to map fully or sometimes with some mismatches to the reference that you're aligning to. Um, and you can also do local alignment. Um, and so local alignment is, you know, it, it, it allows some of the query sequence to map and some to not map. Um, and un, unmapped sequences wind up getting ignored. Um, this is not something that we normally have to consider, but if you're having trouble with alignment or if you're working particularly with like a stranger non-model transcriptome, it's worth thinking about. There are different modes in which you can run aligners. Um, particularly for the aligner BWA, which isn't used that often in RNA sequencing, but I thought it was worth people being aware. Okay, so pros of performing a local alignment, you can minimize adapter contamination and usually not have to actually um, trim your sequence. Um, but, you know, it's, are your three prime bow spaces part of your sequence or your adapter? Um, and then the other thing is, you know, with local alignments, BWA MEM and Bowtie 2 support local alignment, but Top Hat and HiSat 2, and I don't think STAR necessarily supports um, a local alignment. And it's slower, it's a lot slower, which makes sense because you have to consider many more potential, you know, seeds that align to the reference by breaking up your query sequence. And you may need to do more complex post alignment processing of, the, of your aligned um, BAM file, which we'll talk a little bit more about. So that's just, you know, local versus global alignment, something to keep in mind. Generally, global alignment will work very well because we have longer reads than we did just a few years ago um, and a lot more compute power. But just keep this in mind. Okay, so short read aligners, they map, they determine the placement of query sequences, your reads against a known reference, which, you know, could be HG38 or MM10 or RN6 or, or what have you. Um, the, best, the best known one is one that we've probably all used at least a couple times, which is BLAST, which takes, you know, one or a few query sequences and will produce many potential matches across the genome. Um, and if you haven't played around with, you know, BLAST to that end, it's kind of fun. Um, and it's very interesting to kind of realize that, you know, in many genomes, you have to have a certain length of uh, sequence in order to get a unique alignment, um, usually at least 22 base pairs. But now, you know, we have longer reads, and so this is less of an issue. Um, there are many aligners available. I tend to use the Burroughs Wheeler or BWA, um, which is really good. And then this is an older slide. So this focuses on Bowtie 2 and HiSat 2. But I have slides later in this talk that will focus on aligners and pseudo aligners that are currently available and how to load them up on-prem. 
Um, but bow tie too is one that is very much still uh, in high uh, level of use in the RNAC community and the alignment community generally. Okay, so mapping versus alignment. Um, so mapping determ determines the positions where a read shares a short sequence with the reference, and then alignment starts with the seed and it determines how the, the bases are best matched around this seed. So a high mapping quality is not necessarily a high alignment score. Mapping quality basically says, you know, where can I position this query sequence across the genome? Um, and so it, it so you want to know you know how mappable is something and a map quality of zero generally indicates that something uh, aligns to multiple regions of the genome. It it, it is a it is non unique mapping and so that's something to to be aware of. Hopefully most of your alignment uh, you know for standard RNA sequencing data if you're not looking at amplicons hopefully most of your map qualities will be quite high like 30 or greater. This is a Fred type score. So the alignment score describes the fit. And that reflects, you know, the correspondence between the read and the reference sequence. So if you look at um, on the left, read one, it has high mapping quality, but it has two mismatches to the reference. So it has a low alignment score. So it maps uniquely to this one region. So the map quality would be high, but then it has mismatches. So the alignment would be low. And then on the right hand side in green, read two maps to two locations. So it has low mapping quality you know, it'd be a map quality of zero, but it matches perfectly. Um, so maybe this is a read that comes from, you know, a duplicated region of the genome. So it has a high alignment score. So these are, these are, you know, these are just things to keep in mind as we go through this. Okay, so the vast majority of the time, it, the, when I first started doing, you know, genome sequencing, um, it, paired end was like expensive and we didn't always do it. And, and now if we want to do paired end, we can pretty much always do paired end, which is awesome. Um, so if you can, especially for RNA sequencing, and if it makes sense, and if you're, especially if you're working with longer reads, this doesn't necessarily apply to if you're looking, if you're doing like a microRNA based library, but if you have longer reads, having paired end reads improves the mapping. So if you map one read with, if you, if you map one of those reads with high competence, it anchors the pair, and it sort of lets the, it sort of limits where you can go with the other side of the pair. Um, and then there's also nice things about mapping paired end where you can get um, it, most aligners that do paired end mapping will do automatic insert size calculation, which is nice to know. Um, so there's three possible outcomes of mapping a read one, read two, or R1, R2 pair. So you might get only one pair that'll map, and that's called a singleton or an orphan. Um, both reads can map, but within some reasonable distance range, which is usually, I don't know, 10 kilobases, I think. It's, it's, it's larger than you might think. Um, and this is called a proper pair. And then you can have both reads mapping, but with an unexpected insert size or orientation or to different contigs, and it's a discordant pair. So you can have, this is kind of cool, you can actually use this sort of, um, if you have high enough depth of sequencing, you can actually sometimes use this to detect breakpoints in like cancer genomes, which you need a lot of depth of sequencing and it's sort of a, a random, um, uh, I guess, application, but it's kind of cool that you can use discordant pairs in kind of functional ways. Um, and then the insert size that you get with paired end mapping, it's reported in the alignment record for both proper and discordant pairs. So this can be important for downstream processes because some aligners want you to hand it an insert size or expect a certain insert size distribution. So that's important to be aware of. Okay, so here's the alignment workflow. So basically, and I'll, I'll walk you guys through this, um, but first we, we obtain the, the reference assembly. And so for BWA, this is the index function. For Bowtie 2, this is the build function. For Callisto, this is the index function. And, and it's different. These, we're just going through these three main, um, you know, these three main aligners and Callisto is a sooner aligner. So you build your aligner specific reference index. Um, and you only have to do this once for every genome that you want to work on. So, you know, I have a HG38 and an HG19 and an MM10 index for Callisto, BWA, and Bowtie2. Um, and then uh, walking through the actual alignment process, you know, well, you'll, you know, go through uh, QC of reads, alignment, and then there's a whole bunch of processes converting your aligned um, reads into, you know, a position sorted duplicate marked indexed BAM file. Um, so, so these are an example of the tools that you'll use and we'll walk through these one by one.
But first, we're going to start with the reference assembly, because this is sort of the most important step. And if you're working in a non-model organism, it's pretty important. Um, so for obtaining a reference, so, so this brings us to the question, what is a reference? And it's actually any set of named sequences. Names are typically chromosome names, and they're generally referred to as contigs. Um, and, but it's, you can think of a reference a little bit differently um, if you want. Uh, but you, know, you can get assembled genomes from Ensemble, UCSC, GenBank for eukaryotes. These are typically FOSTA files, .fa or .fosta, and they'll often have annotations of features, which are genome feature files or GFF files. Um, also genome transfer files or GTF files. And for RNA sequencing, you will typically need the FOSTA and the GFF or GTF in order to properly annotate the transcriptome. Um, for prokaryotes or microbes, I don't know how many people are working on non-eukaryotic organisms, but GenBank and NCBI have those, organi have those um, organismal uh, sequences. And they're working on prokaryotes for alignment. It's really fun because they're, they're, their genomes are tiny. So everything goes really fast. But actually, a reference can be any set of sequences of interest. So let's say that you only care about, you know, the expression of GFP or a tagged and expressed gene in an RNA sequencing experiment. You can make a reference that's just that sequence you care about and align to it. Um, and that's something that, you know, when I realized that, I was like, oh, this is really powerful. The reference can really be whatever you want it to be, um, you know, with the caveat that that'll affect your downstream processing. Okay. So brief uh, interlude on FOSTA format, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but just an overview if you're not. FOSTA files contain a set of sequence records. They have a sequence name line, which always starts with this caret um, that's very useful for grepping and for filtering. Um, and it's followed by a name and other more descriptive information. And then you have one of more sequence lines, which never start with the, uh, with the greater than symbol. So here's an example of the mitochondrial DNA sequence for HG19. It'll start with uh, you know, uh, the greater than symbol followed by cur M, and then the sequence um, lists at, I believe, 60 characters per line. Um, and then here's an example of a microRNA from Mirbase. Um, and so you can see it's got quite a long description um, because it's describing this whole microRNA. But then the actual FOSTA sequence is you know, only about, I don't know, 90 bases long. Um, so there's lots of, you know, they can be long chromosomal contigs, but they can also be much shorter um, sequences as well. Okay, so considering your reference, um, you want to make sure that it makes sense for your study. So if you, a lot of species have some kind of reasonable reference these days. Uh, a, this, this original slide was written a few years ago where well, if you wanted to align, if you were working in an organism that really wasn't sequenced, but you had a relative of that organism that was sequenced, is it close enough to your species that you get reasonable alignment? Is the reference complete? And these are still things to think about if you're working on organisms that are a little bit further away from you know, anything that's sequenced, or if you know that there's no good sequence or no good assembled reference for your organism, it's worth thinking, does it have a cousin you can potentially work with? Or do you want to think about actually assembling a, a total, uh, a whole genome and a whole transcriptome, which is not something that I cover, but something that I'm happy to answer questions about. Um, you also want to know, does it contain repeats? Uh, what types of repeats and how are those repeats annotated? Um, so, you know, in human, there's, you can, there's soft clipping and hard clipping of repeats and of repeat regions, and that'll indicate um, uh, without getting into the weeds too much. Basically, soft clipping um, indicates that uh, repeat sequences are, I believe, listed in lowercase nucleotides, and hard clipping, they're just listed by a series of ends. Um, so that's, it's important to know that because that'll change your, uh, your ability to align to that reference. Um, and then you want to know from what source. So are you getting your things from UCSC? Or are you getting them from Ensemble? Or are you getting them from NCBI? So what source and what version? That's very important. You should track this. Um, and then you want to know what annotations exist. So if you, if you don't have any feature, in it, you have a genome, but you don't have a transcriptome, um, that will make things really difficult because you'll have to use this other process to actually de novo assemble your transcriptome. And that's a totally doable thing, but it's an additional step in the process to be aware of. You also wanna watch out for sequence name issues. Um, so like UCSC and Ensemble, um, you know, cur 12 versus 12, that will change how you handle things downstream. And, and yes, it's something that, you know, at some level, you can kind of solve using a tool like, you know, Auk said in Unix, but if you just know straight up, oh, hey, it's gonna look like this, and, and this is what I need downstream, your annotation sequence names have to match the name in your reference. 
So if you have a chromosome-based GTF and you have a non, and you have just a purely numeric listing of contigs in your initial reference FOSTA file, that will throw an error. So this is just something to be aware of because um, the error messages you get are not always super interpretable. Okay, so moving on through the alignment workflow, workflow we've gotten our reference assembly, we build our aligner specific, and we're going to build our aligner specific index. And this is normally quite a, quite a quick and easy step. Or sometimes it's not quick, but it's generally pretty easy. So it's specific to each aligner. Sometimes they'll take several hours to build. I know that my BWA human genome 38 index took four or five hours to build on-prem. Um, but you build it once, and then you reuse it for a line. If you're using that aligner to that reference. So usually you hand it FOSTA files. Sometimes you also hand it a GTF for transcriptome aware aligners. Um, so like Callisto, I give it a GTF and I give it a FOSTA of whatever genome I want it to handle. And then the output will be a number of binary alignment files that will sometimes have funky um, extensions uh, like IDX or AMB, depending on what alignment, aligner you're working on. And for me, this is, this is just best practices. Someone who taught me said I should do things this way and, and having organization really helps. But you know, make sure each index is in its own well-named directory that indicates you know, your aligner, your source of your uh, your source of you know the um, the reference and then the reference itself. So these are these are actual you know um, directory trees that you know that reflect my directory um, on MedPop AFib. This is how I stash my references, and and it's very helpful because I know exactly where they come from. Um, so you know document well now to to save yourself a headache later. Okay, so that but that process typically goes pretty quickly. You know that's just a few hours. Um, okay. So we've already talked about QC and trimming of reads earlier. Now we're going to talk about actually aligning the reads to a reference. So aligners, so we'll talk about the SAM file format, um, and this is important, especially with respect to space considerations. Aligners take this index file and your query fast queue sequences as input, um, and the alignments are output in sequence alignment map format or SAM format. This, is, this format is pretty stable. It's been stable for well, something like 10 years now. Um, it does change occasionally. Um, so this, the SAM compendium, that, that linked PDF there, extremely useful. Um, I am actually not, I don't have enough time to get into all of the details on SAM file specifications, but you can do really, really complex things with SAM and BAM format, like filter very specific types of optical duplicates or PCR duplicates. Um, and, and the version of the slides that I'll put up will actually have those non-hidden, um, so you can walk through it. But uh, briefly, a SAM file has a header, which includes a reference for the sequence names and their lengths. So you can always check your header if you want to, you know, kind of get a little bit of additional detail about what you were doing when you were aligning things, um, or if it's data from somebody else. Um, and then you'll have alignment records, one for each sequence reads. This will have mapped and unmapped reads typically, unless you filtered it to only contained mapped or only contained unmapped reads. And the alignments for the R1 and the R2, when we're talking about paired end sequencing, have separate records with fields that actually refer to the mate um, that we can filter on in SAM file format. And then there's 11 fixed fields and then there are these key type value tuples. Um, and so it skips a couple slides that go into that in detail um, just because we don't have time. Um, but once we've gotten our initial alignment completed and that in the case of like bow tie too, some of my alignments take, you know, like a week. Um, most of them are faster than that, but they can take a while if you have a lot of data. So just be prepared for that alignment to take some time. Um, okay, so on SAM and BAM files, SAM and BAM are two forms of the same data. Um, you know, SAM is a plain text format, so you can, you know, do cat on it in Unix and actually see something. BAMs are the same um, data in a, in a custom compressed format that results in a pretty massive reduction in the space that it uh, requires. So, you know, it's always, so BAM files are much smaller than SAM files. It's like a 5x or more compression. Um, BAM files support what's called fast random access. SAM files do not, but this requires indexing, which takes just a few seconds on most BAM files, up to like a minute or two. Um, most tools, most downstream tools support BAM format and they may require indexing. So you want to get, so best practices after you've aligned to your genome, get rid of any intermediate SAM files and BAM files and only save your final sorted indexed BAM. Whoever manages your space for you on prem or on the cloud or wherever will be grateful for you for, for taking uh, advantage of this. Um, and then you want to keep your alignment artifacts separate from the original FASTQ files. You can regenerate your alignments 
but you can't regenerate your raw sequences. And, you know, we only, if you're getting things from the Broad or from DFCI, you know, people will keep around FASTQ files for you for a while, often a month or sometimes even six months, but not forever. So you need to think about what's the best way to handle that long term. Okay, so moving into these last few steps uh, where we're handling the BAM file. Um, okay, so we want to sort and index these SAM and BAM files because most of our downstream tools will expect us to have some sort of assorted um, SAM or BAM file. Um, so the SAM file created by an aligner contains the read records in name order. That's the same order as the read names in the input FASTQ files. The R1 and the R2 have different SAM records and then SAM to BAM conversion doesn't change this name sorted order. If you sort a BAM by using um, SAM tool sort, that'll put your records in position or locus order by contig name and then by start by leftmost start position. Um, and the contig name is in the order given in the SAM or the BAM header. So if it's in an order you don't expect, double check your header. Um, and then it's based on the order of the sequences and the FOSTA file that's used to build the reference. Uh, just as a heads up, sorting is very compute and IO intensive. It can take quite a bit of time for a large, like many gigabyte BAM file. Um, but in practice for a lot of our, for a lot of our files, it's not, it doesn't take too much time. And then if you, and then indexing, which is pretty fast, once you've locus sorted your BAM, indexing produces this .bii file and allows fast random access. And th this typically only takes a few seconds to a minute. Okay, so duplicate handling is something I'm gonna go over and it's something that, you know, we have, uh, it, you just wanna be aware of how you've handled it and document this well, because different tools will want different duplicate handling. So this is an optional step, but most protocols want you to handle duplicates in some fashion. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, in other primer sessions, molecular indexing um, and, uh, you know, basically determining is something a real duplicate or is it a PCR or optical duplicate. Um, so, but, so here we're not distinguishing those that requires a slightly different um, process, but there's a definition of alignment duplicates. So single end reads or singleton or discordant paired end alignment reads, the alignments have the same start position. Um, and for property, properly paired reads, the pairs have the same external uh, coordinates. So the five prime and three prime coordinates of the insert. Um, if they're exactly the same, we assume that it's a duplicate, which is why molecular indexing, as Caroline mentioned last week, is so important. Um, so we have two choices for handling this. There's the SAM tools tool, remove dupe, which gets rid of duplicates entirely. It's faster, but you'll lose data. Um, and it doesn't intelligently handle um, data from multiple lanes. And then Picard mark duplicates, that flags your duplicates. This is uses the 0x400 BAM flag, which again, you'll be able to see more of in, my, um, in the PDF of the slides I produce and we send out. It's slower, but you retain all of your alignments. This is, this is what I do. I use Picard mark duplicates. Um, and it align, alignments from different lanes or different replicates are considered separately. You can also, there's this uh, mark duplicates with mate cigar tool, which I haven't used as much, but it takes what's called a cigar string, which is a little, um, it's a little way to determine what's going on in an alignment. And it's slower than plain mark duplicates. And both tools are quirky in their own ways. Um, so there's, you know, certain funky things that happen with Picard mark duplicates. Uh, it's, you know, just learn a tool and get comfortable with it. I do recommend learning Picard. Um, okay. So continuing on, uh, so last part of this, we'll do alignment metrics in QC. So there's a couple of quick alignment metrics. Um, SAMTOOL's flag stat, that gives you simple statistics based on your alignment record flag values. So it gives you the total number of sequences, the total number of map sequences, the total number properly paired, the number of duplicates, um, and it's, which is zero if you did not elect to mark your duplicates. Um, and you know, and so there's also, there's also IDX stats, which gives you the reads aligned with each contig. Um, and these you can run just using SAM tools. Many aligners will actually produce something for you. Um, but it's worth knowing that SAM tools, if you, if you have a BAM file and you're like, what's going on with this BAM file? You got it from a collaborator. You can run these tools on it and figure out what's going on. Okay, um, there's two eras of the SAM tools program. Um, there's old SAM tools and there's new SAM tools. And just make sure that, you know, so this isn't an issue on prem, but when you're using SAM tools, use 1.3 or greater. There were a few versions of SAM tools that were pretty buggy, um, but now they're really stable. So we have 1.5, 1.7, and 1.8 on prem um, at present. Okay, 
So I'm gonna, we're gonna stop going through the alignment aspect and they're gonna spend um, the rest of the talk basically running through aligners and pseudo aligners and then um, basically the rest of the process. But I wanted to spend some time on alignment just because that's the most important part of this process. So there's several aligners available on Prem. Um, there's, several, there's several pseudo aligners that are available as well. Um, and I also like to give a shout out to Bits here. I believe I'm the one who requested that Salmon be, Salmon be installed on Prem as a tool because I was thinking about using it and they had it turned around for me in about a week. So if you need something to be a dot kit, um, talk to the folks at Bits because they're very responsive. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through aligner usage um, and walk through the aligners that we have available on Prem fairly quickly because um, my end recommendation is that you pick one that you like or you pick one that makes sense for your workflow and get comfortable with it. Um, but we'll go through bow tie too. This is sort of a, a big, it's an ultra fast short read aligner. It's a dependency for other alignment tools like Top Hat 2 and High Sat 2. We have two versions of, we have bow tie and we have bow tie 2 available on Prem. And this is the paper that described it, which came out in 2012. So bow tie is very much still a useful tool. Many, many other tools use it. Um, so we've also got Top Hat. Top Hat is still used, but it, it can be, it's uh, slower, it's splice aware. So it'll identify mapping junctions between exons. It's mostly superseded by HiSat2, but I still hear about people doing top hat alignments. It does take a while. Um, so it's worth keeping in mind that some of these older alignments are a little, old, older aligners are a little slow. Um, we've also got HiSat2. Um, so this, is, this is uses this um, hierarchical graph MF, FM index method, which I'm not gonna pretend to be super uh, you know, in depth about, um, but it uses this new fast method and it's like something crazy like a, you know, a 20x increase over Top Hat 2. So, so we can use HiSat 2 on Prem as well. Um, and this is a much more, this HiSat 2 came out, you know, just uh, a year ago, really. So Amelia, is, I'm going to interrupt just uh, for a second with a question that came up sure. on the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to try to, to read it here. Um, you mean, do you mean duplicate, um, optical, optical duplicates? Because in RNA-seq, a high expression gene will have multiple reads aligned and hence duplicates. Yeah, so I mostly mean optical. Well, when you mark duplicates, you mark anything that comes up as a duplicate using the, um, uh, the uh, I guess, what's the right word? Uh, using, I guess, the, the schema that I described. So if you do see the same gene that's expressed like this, I, I'm not saying you want to get rid of duplicates, um, but you do want to mark them. You want to know. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that you want to be aware of duplicates. I will say that due to the way it, it's a high expressing gene will often have a little bit of like a couple base pair shift in where it starts in terms of the insert size. So I've, I, I totally get what you're talking about. Um, and you won't typically see all of the reads from that highly expressed gene showing up as duplicates. I'm also not saying you should necessarily do anything with duplicates, but rather be aware of them. Um, but, that's, but that's a good example of, yeah, being able to distinguish between is this a duplicate because it amplified a lot or is this a duplicate because I genuinely have a lot of this present um, in, in my, you know, in the pool that I generated a library from um, without respect to the amount of PCR that I've done. That's, that's an important distinguish. That's an important thing to distinguish. Um, and at some level, I think that'll depend on you having a sense of, you know, is this, is this gene highly expressed and should I expect a high level of duplication? Um, but that, but yeah, that's a really good question. And that's also a really good example of why molecular indexing is important because that'll let you distinguish, oh, is this an optical duplicate or do we just have a lot of this, of this uh, transcript present in the library? I hope that, I hope that gets, sort of gets at the answer, though I don't have a perfect one for that question. I, I think it does, thank you. But uh, to the person who raised the question, please, please um, raise more questions if you'd like further information. Yes, yes. Thanks, please, please help me clarify. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, so HiSat2 came out about a year ago. Um, STAR, okay, so STAR is, STAR is really cool. Um, so STAR came out in 2013. It's, it's in heavy use um, without getting into single cell stuff in detail. Uh, it's, it's much faster than other aligners by a factor of 50. It refers to splice transcripts alignment to a reference. On PREM, we have two versions of STAR. And many aligner, many researchers are moving towards STAR as the aligner of choice for bulk RNA sequencing data. For single cell RNA sequencing data, Cell Ranger does actually use an implementation of STAR on its back end. So I think STAR is really good. Um, that's an aligner that um, I'm not like super familiar with because I, and I'll get into this, I use super, I use pseudo aligners, but my understanding for using a standard aligner for RNA sequencing data is that STAR is 
really, really reproducible really fast. Okay, so okay, so I'll talk about pseudo aligners quickly. And I'll talk about R sub read, which is sort of a pseudo. So they have different names, you know, pseudo alignments or quasi alignments, but they all basically use a slightly, they use a faster method of generating seats um, and thus aligning reads with a reasonable amount of confidence to a genome. Um, so Callisto is my favorite aligner. Um, and we've got three versions of it available on prem. I typically use the, the, most, the newest version. Um, the index builds really fast. You can quantify 50 to 70 million reads in like an hour. Um, so there's the documentation. Um, this is by Lior Pactor's lab. Uh, the documentation is fantastic, by the way. Um, and so I, I really like this aligner a lot, um, the pseudo aligner a lot. I think it's great. Um, and I found it's very reproducible. I've used it on, you know, mouse and um, mouse and human and several other organisms as well. I'm less familiar with salmon, um, but salmon's, uh, but that's, uh, you know, one of our, uh, it's Michael Love who developed DEC2. And then we've got, uh, we've got, you know, uh, Rafael Azari who's local. Um, so the documentation is good. Um, we have, I don't have as much experience with it personally, um, but my understand is that it's, it's also, my understanding is it's also, um, it's fast and it's also, uh, bias aware in terms, I think that's in terms of uh, what strand you're talking about, uh, quantification of transcript expression. So, so salmon's one to look at as well. Um, and then R sub read, which I have some experience with, it's really well documented. And it's an R package that does this ultra fast alignment of RNA seq data. And then you quantify said data using, using uh, feature counts, which is part of R sub read, um, or which is a re related package to R sub read. So uh, you know, our subbreed is also very fast, though I think Callisto is quite a bit faster. And our subbreed, I believe, is also installable as a command line package. Okay, so how do you, so I, I just went through like six aligners, seven aligners, how do you pick one to use? Um, I have, you know, I go by the choose one or two and learn their options well. I'm really familiar with Callisto and I'm less familiar with, and I'm familiar with uh, single cell implementations of STAR and I'm less familiar with other aligners. Um, I'm also pretty familiar with Bowtie 2. Um, so there's many steps involved in this full alignment workflow. And it's important to go through this manually a few times, like, you know, either in an interactive shell session or by batching, like, you know, this step and then this step. Um, but this gets really tedious once you've got a good workflow that you like. So best practices, I would say you want to automate these series of complex steps by making a pipeline script, like a bash or a Python script. Um, and then I also included this. It took me a little while to figure out how to, uh, for those who are more Unix aware than I, um, that's awesome. It took me a little while to figure out how to pass arguments to a bash script, um, but so I've included that link that helped me. But my best advice is to find a aligner that works for you, dig into the documentation and just get, get comfortable. Which will take- I wanna interrupt for just a second with I think a definitional question. Um, um, one of the sure. attendees has asked, um, if you can clarify a little bit the, def the difference between an aligner and a pseudo aligner. Oh, that's a good question. Okay, uh, I need to think about the math for this. So my understanding is that the way that pseudo aligners generate a random seed is like is faster than the way that an aligner will actually like. I don't think they go through the same full process of um, of um, the 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 mapping of a region and then and then using that initial seed from mapping uh, to to fully align your query sequence. Um, but I, yeah, I apologize. I don't have a, a good definition for that. Pseudo aligners tend to be faster and then typically um, slightly less accurate, but by certain metrics. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a better, um, a better answer for that one though. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, apologies on that. That was one where I was like, I should probably brush up on this. My apologies. Okay. So we've walked through aligners. Um, so I wanna walk through the, the last few steps will go pretty fast. I don't have as many slides for these. And I know that we're getting down to, uh, down to time. Um, so just in terms of basic analysis and downstream analysis, which we'll go through here. So you've got, okay. So you have your aligned data, you have a BAM file, right? Some aligners have a recommended quantifier. So for Top Hat, that's Cufflinks. For Callisto, that's Sleuth, um, which I personally find to be a bit of a pain to use. Um, for HTSeq, which I haven't talked about too much, but that's a Python implementation of alignment. There's HTC count. And you don't always have to use the recommended quantifier. Um, so what I'll walk you guys through next week for the live code demonstration is I use the text import package to import quantified data from Callisto um, into DEseq2. And then I let DEseq2 handle everything downstream. So alignment just reports aligned regions of 
read the genome or assembly, but we need to quantify the number of reads over a region for each sample. And generally, the regions that you're quantifying are specified using a GTF or a GFF file, which defines elements. These are usually exons, but it could be, as we talked about earlier, a custom set of loci, or um, you can do pre-mRNA alignments where you consider the whole gene body to be an exon, which is something I do a lot for single cell data. Some aligners will do this for you and other tools allow for this functionality. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. You will need to quantify your data once you've aligned it. And once you've quantified your data, you need to process and normalize that data. So once the reads are counted over a transcriptome for a set of data, you need to normalize those data. And that's necessary, this may seem obvious, but that's necessary because the read depth of your samples is likely to be different. You might have 45 million reads in sample one, 55 million reads in sample two, and that means you can't make a direct comparison of those values until, you know, you effectively either, you know, downsample, not really downsample, but, you know, you use a, a size factor to, to overweight the less sequence sample or underweight the more sequence sample. Many tools will do this for you once you're reading their quantified data, such as DEseq, EdgeR, or Cufflinks. And this produces a normalized matrix of values so that you can have a comparison across this matrix for sample one, sample two, sample three, and so on. Um, there's two uh, words that we typically, two acronyms that we typically use, TPM or transcripts per million reads. Um, that's, that's more common. And then an older term is FPKM or fragments per kilobase per tr of transcript per million mapped reads. But the point is, that processing and normalizing data, once you've quantified your data over transcriptome, this lets you compare across treatment or tissue conditions. Okay, so we'll go through identifying differentially expressed genes. So here we're talking about differential gene expression analysis, which is one of our downstream analysis tools. So there's a lot of tools available here. Um, you know, I have my favorite, which happens to be DEseq2, but uh, I think, you know, most of them are really quite good. Um, and basically these tools ingest this normalized matrix of quantified RNA sequencing data for both or many conditions or tissues and identify genes with quote, significant changes in expression across a condition, which obviously depends on what statistical test you're doing. So here significance can be defined a number of ways, but generally using an adjusted p-value test. EDGEAR and DEseq2 both use a very stringent test, Benjamin E. Hochberg or BH, um, and for different tools, that's just going to be variable. Um, but you just want to keep in mind, what's your adjusted p-value test? Um, because the p-value and the adjusted p-value, given the, the number of comparisons that you're making here, can be very different. Okay, so now we'll walk through, um, okay, we have a little time at the end. We'll walk through pathway analysis of differentially expressed genes. So there's lots of options. Um, David's kind of the old school one, um, but that's, it's really nice to work with lots of different organisms. PantherDB uses gene ontology databases. Um, gene ontology is really useful. You can use KEG directly. I find their web interface a little difficult to use, but once you figure it out, it's not bad. Um, there's WebGestalt for gene set enrichment analysis. That's at webgestalt.org. And then there's Enricher from the Mayan Lab. Um, I really like Enricher as a web-based one. I'll show you guys a little bit of what the output looks like because it, it lets you kind of, I like it as a first pass because it shows KEG and wiki pathways and bioreactor and gene ontology and um, you know the Allen brain atlas and like uh, the Jensen mouse tissue comparison. It shows a, shows you a lot of things at once. But there's also software, um, so GSEA gene set enrichment software that is which the Broad is in, is involved with. Um, you can also download the software and use it. And there's a ton of packages on Bioconductor R packages. I will go through usage of Topgo next week. Um, but there's also React MPA, Pathfinder, and then there's a R implementation of WebGestalt as well. So in Richer, I like to use it as a first pass. Um, if you just do a search for it, you can either use the um, uh, you can either use this URL for mayanlab.cloud slash enricher, or you can just do a search for enricher. Um, it's got the very millennial spelling that drops the E. Um, but I like it as a first pass because this is just me using their test set. But you've got under ontologies, you have you know, your standard three Go, uh, BP, MF, and CC ontologies, but then you've also got human phenotype ontology, MGI ontology, gens and tissues, compartments and diseases. And there's a lot for under each of these tabs. So I really like Enricher as a first pass to give me a sense of you know, what's going on here. Where am I seeing you know, common pathways showing up across many different tools? Um, I often don't use it as actually generating uh, figures, but I do really like it. Um, for just a first pass. And then for something that's a little bit more robust, 
apps, I really like um, WebGalt and I like using um, the background function. So you don't have this functionality. Um, you don't necessarily have this functionality in Enricher, but what I like is, you know, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but under the reference gene list, you can select the reference set or you can use your specific reference set. So I was doing, to give an example, I was doing an analysis um, of rat differential gene expression and I used a reference set that was um, genes that were common to rat and genes that had good orthologs between rat and human. And the, the pathway analysis looked completely different against a standard background of the rat genome versus human and rat, these human and rat um, genes that were specifically compared because uh, it was a different background set. So keep your background set in mind and, and think about, you know, is your background really the genome, you know, or the transcriptome entirely, or is it a certain set of genes that you might be drawing off of? Okay, so that's actually what I've got, and uh, it's just shy of 920. I'm sorry for going all the way to the end. Um, I was hoping we'd have more time for questions, but stay tuned for next week. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through using text import and DEseq2 to identify differentially expressed genes. This will be an interactive Terra tutorial. This is the address where things are located. I need to talk to the folks at Terra to make sure that everyone can take this URL and quickly clone it off so that then you will all be able to sort of do this analysis along with me. Um, and we'll be using the R package TopGo on differentially expressed genes to do some simple pathway analysis using gene ontology as a resource. Um, and so thank you so much for listening. I'll take any additional questions. in the Thank you before. so much, Amelia. I certainly learned a lot and from all of the really thoughtful questions we're getting and I'm trying to manage. Um, it sounds like the, the audience did too. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know that there's time to address all of the questions, but I want to highlight two that seem to be um, sort of general questions and, and also transitions for next week. Um, the first of those is um, whether there's, we ought to be concerned that there are so many experiment dependent options that there can't be really a truly standard workflow for most human RNA-seq experiments or whether you think perhaps there's a best practice that you can deviate from in small ways, but there's a, a sort of a, a pathway that one should at least start with. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's, it, at the end of the day, differential gene expression analysis is statistics based. And so there's ways to, to game that. And that's why my recommendation was look at a couple of, do it a couple different ways. I would say there's best practices in terms of like marking, you know, in terms of handling alignment and marking duplicates. Differential gene expression analysis is, I mean, my best recommendation is use a robust package that has a paper associated with it use a robust workflow that other people tend to use. And then at least what you're doing will match what is generally being done um, by people in the field. And that's more or less what I'm doing. What, I, what I'm going to show you guys next week is not like innovative or anything other than that, you know, we're doing it on Terra and we can all hopefully do it at the same time. It's I'm using like a tutorial literally developed by the DEseq people in conjunction with the Callisto and text import people. So I guess what I would say is, there are standard practices, more or less what I'll show you guys next week does adhere to those standard practices. Um, one good standard practice is to filter low, minimally expressed genes because you can identify a lot of differential expression in, no, you can get a high p-value if something is not expressed at all and then you have one transcript expressed, there's a way to compare that. So you wind up getting, sorry, a very low p-value that makes that look significant. But if we filter the genes that are effectively noise, then that's a way to basically say, okay, we're just going to get rid of everything that's, the, you know, that's minimally expressed. But the flip side of that is if the gene that you want to look at and you want to study is minimally expressed, it makes identifying whether or not it's differentially expressed um, a much more difficult prospect that'll either require more replicates or deeper sequencing in order to, you know, not wind up in that noise threshold. Um, so that's not, that's not a perfect answer. Um, but I will say what I, do what I'll show you next week is definitely as close to best practices as I can get it. Great, thank you. And I think that actually addressed aspects of several of the other questions. And so I'll just conclude with, with one, one more question that was actually the first question, but I think is really a, uh, that came up today, but really a nice transition to next week, um, which is basically why Terra? Um, why, why have you decided to focus on Terra rather than implementing some of these same analyses on GCP or the Brood cluster more generally? All of these were initially implemented on the Brogue cluster and I do things on Terra. This is a great question, by the way. Um, I, I, you know, I've actually been teaching on high performance computing systems for about six years and getting everyone into the same environment is a disaster. 
So I picked Terra not because it's the easiest way to do things, but because when we share things like this and we do things interactively, I think Terra is really good for maintaining the reproducibility of that environment. So I, I absolutely have workflows on prem that you know I'm not showing you guys. Um, but which I can show you guys if you email me. So I, so all my workflows I develop originally on prem or with prem is the back end. Um, but this one I wanted to do on Terra because I wanted to have it be shareable because a lot of people have said, Hey, do you have a bulk RNA sequencing differential gene expression analysis, you know, um, work flow that I can work through. So I'm basically doing it on Terra because of the sharing aspect of it. But yes, I absolutely develop things on prem.